Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, we will proceed with the recitation of Holy Quran. Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen. I, Lara Farid, on behalf of Institute of Regional Studies, welcome you all to today's session. Uh, before beginning the session, I would like to extend a warm thank you to the speakers for taking our time and gracing us with their presence. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're talking about a very important subject, the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is the third largest ocean in the world. Most of it is in the Southern Hemisphere and lies at the crossroads of Africa, Asia, and Australia, housing several littoral countries that play critical roles in the region due to their location. The military bases of foreign countries like the US, UK, China, France, Japan, etc. indicate the vital role of Indian Ocean. Given that the reconceptualization of evolving security, economic, and environmental trends is necessary to envisage the prospect of conflict and cooperation in the Indian Ocean in the coming decades. Similarly, for a greater understanding of how the evolving trends of transforming the geostrategic, geoeconomic, and geopolitical landscape of the Indian Ocean, the Institute of Regional Studies and Indian Ocean Studies Center at the National Institute of Maritime Affairs, NEMA, Islamabad has established a consortium for studying the Indian Ocean from a multidisciplinary perspective. Our today's seminar titled Maritime Security Issues in the Indian Ocean, Perspective of Literal or Global State is a part of the same series that aims at understanding the Indian Ocean. I'll formally begin the session uh, by inviting Ambassador Nadeem Riaz, President Institute of Regional Studies, for his welcome remarks. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and a good morning to everyone. It's such a pleasure today that we have two esteemed speakers who will tell us about the Indian Ocean. Uh, the Indian Ocean is the third largest uh, ocean in the world. It covers approximately 20% of the total Earth and is bound by about 38 states, and it makes up for 40% of the total coastline of the world. The region is home to 35% of the total world's population. The ocean holds 16.8% of proven natural gas reserves. The Indian Ocean economies account for over 35.5% of global iron production and 17.8% of the world coal production. The ocean is home to major sea routes connecting the Middle East, Africa, East Asia with Europe and with Americas and hosts over 23 of the world top 100 container ports. The abundance of natural resources among other factors has facilitated obviously trade led growth within this region. Interestingly, China has emerged as a most important trading partner of the Indian Ocean region. The lack of regional maritime security architecture has promoted major powers to compete for control over these resources and sea lanes in this ocean. But along with the benefits and the opportunities which it offers, there are also challenges which the Indian Ocean has and they are territorial disputes, maritime terrorism, piracy, illegal trafficking of arms and human beings, drugs, excessive exploitation of natural resources, climate change, and environmental degradation. Furthermore, the evolving security, economic, and environmental trends around the globe have made it essential that this ocean should have cooperation rather than conflict. The Institute of Regional Studies and NEMA, National Institute of Maritime Affairs, 
got into a collaboration a few months ago. And with this collaboration, we agreed to work upon subjects which were new, away from what most think tanks deal with. So with this in mind, I'm very thankful to the leadership of NEMA for collaborating with IRS. And we will be having a series of seminars, webinars, and talks on the Indian Ocean. Today is the launch event. And in addition to this, over the next few months, we are going to be talking about the origins, developments, and the rise of the Indian Ocean in world politics, non-traditional challenges, threats in the Indian Ocean, nuclearization of the Indian Ocean, its effects in the region and beyond. We will be talking about I2U2, ingress in the Indian Ocean and the impact which it will have on Pakistan maritime security. We will be talking about Sir Creek. We will be talking about the Indian buildup and its effects in the region and beyond. And we will be talking about Pakistan and the changing power dynamics in the Indian Ocean. Now, after having these six, seven events, we are going to take the reports from all the events we have had. We will then deliberate and discuss it at IRS and at NEMA, and we will make concrete analysis and recommendations, which we will then share with the concerned people. So thank you very much, sir, for being here. Thank you for this enlightened audience for being here in this weather. And just before coming here, DG Nima made a very nice comment that today is definitely not the weather to get into an intellectual activity. The weather is too nice, but well, life goes on and we have to do our work. Thank you very much for being here. A very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of uh, Director General Nima and myself. And uh, without much uh, further discussion or uh, deliberating, over to you, Lareb. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Nadeem. I would now like to invite on stage our first expert on the subject, Vice Admiral uh, Retired Iftikhar Rao. Vice Admiral Iftikhar Rao has more than 40 years of ex maritime experience. He has served on board and commander ships and is also a naval aviator, which gives him a vast experience of the coast. His recent books, Elements of Blue Economy, is considered widely in Pakistan's maritime circles and academia as a pioneering work in this domain. He's a regular speaker at the National Defense University, staff colleges, National School of Public Policy, and seminars on maritime affairs. With that being said, I would now like to hand over the floor to, to you, sir. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity, IRS and uh, NIMA. And the topic, as I already been told, is maritime security. The two key points that I saw in the topic, maritime security and that about the Indian Ocean. Maritime security is of great importance, be it war or peace. Maritime security is not only during the war, that is the naval part. The maritime security is both important, war and peace. Maritime security is much bigger in scope than military or naval aspects. And that is the topic that I've been told to talk about the military and naval aspect. Maritime security is transnational in nature. Challenges are common and need a coordinated common response by all the regional countries and in fact, all the global parts. Naval military aspect is generally country specific, though regional and global environment affects the country's interest and of the responses and preparations. Maritime security, as you can see, it has been deliberated all, it covers all kind of aspects that can be encountered at sea. Now we are talking about the Indian Ocean. Stick. 
can you hear me better now okay thank you so talking about the indian ocean uh, this is the map showing all the oceans of the world and indian ocean of course is on the right you can see and indian ocean most of part of the indian ocean is in the southern hemisphere not in the northern hemisphere but northern hemisphere is very important from the economic point of view and also from the geostrategic point of view and you will see that this is the northern part and northern part you will see the trade the trade routes the main trade routes gulf route suez route and then the choke points hormuz babul mandar and malacca apart from the others there are other two, uh, smaller choke points also but these three are of very much important for the global trade any blockage or any hindrance in any of these choke points can lead the entire world's economy into trouble in fact last year you must have heard in suez canal only one ship was struck because of mistake and the global trade was impacted greatly and it was resolved within a week or so and then the ocean economic resources that we talked about is it rich and of course then there's uh, all the powers those who have the will and the wherewithal they ex are exploiting it and we need to take cognizance of that indian ocean is important due to both geoeconomics and geo strategic aspects oil and gas from the region and the global seaborne trade passing through it is of great importance disruption in the flow of trade through it we just talked about is a huge concern to the global economy industrialized countries are heavily dependent on the oil and gas from the gulf primarily because of these interests so far us ensured stability in the region but their interest is reducing on the import of oil from the gulf us dependence on gulf oil is reducing so economic activities are shifting from the west to the east now globally so main importers of the gulf oil and gas now are china india japan and korea so china the gulf with china increasing it is said that china is the new us in the middle east and so it is in the china's interest so that the middle east remains stable in the interest of the united states anymore the us rebalance or pivot asia strategy cpec quad aukus and i2u2 all will have impact on the security situation and the tension or competition between various parts in this region hence the interest and competition of all powers in the indian ocean just a glance at it that what are the military or the naval interest of various countries in this region look at the military bases all around biggest of course of interest is djibouti where they are just close to each other their usa facility or base china is france uk italy even saudi arabia now and Uh, other countries you will have obviously usa and uk are there in bahrain usa is there in qatar france is there in ue india apart from its own country it has facilities or the arrangements with these countries also and then of course the digo garcia the biggest us base but uk owned and then close to malacca there is this port blair of india and china has some uh, facility on the cocoa islands probably a radar facility so big powers interest usa china and india which wanna be a big power but may not be so or probably it is projecting itself to be so but it is not there so we'll just see what are their strategies in this uh, and how does it impact in this region us maritime strategy us has been issuing maritime strategies from time to time i will start from the 1996 the main roles of the us navy given in this 96 maritime strategy was sea control power projection deterrence forward presence and strategic sea lift but now this forward presence is a very simple word when you see what what do they mean by forward presence this is what they mean to show both friends and potential adversaries not not necessarily be the adversaries even potential adversaries our capabilities and resolve thus commanding a perception of forceful intent and ensuring a visible presence 
So these ships, U.S. ships or other countries' naval ships, when they are visiting other ports, they are not simply goodwill visits, although they call goodwill visits. The American aircraft carrier, when it comes to uh, operate in the Gulf or in our region, sometimes they attract or they invite the big dignitaries or the big leaders of the regional countries on board, and then they show them a firepower demonstration. So now that firepower demonstration is not just to please them, it is to show and instill in them that you better behave or otherwise this is what we are going to do. Then in 2007, their uh, new maritime strategy came in. This was the Mullen time. So it had a little bit, not because of Mullen, but the, the, in this time, they made it a little, uh, you can say, more human, humanitarian. They added the humanitarian assistance and disaster response, and they talked more of cooperation compared to previous one, and even compared to the next ones that we will see. For well, the first time in 2007, this maritime strategy was combined by the three sea services, as they called it at that time, that is Navy, Coast Guard, and the Marines. Then in the next, sorry, okay, the 2015 was the previous one. So they control, uh, com continued with the sea control, power projection, and deterrence, but rather than forward presence, they came up with the term all domain access. And then the maritime security was contained. Human assist, humanitarian assistance and disaster response was removed as a topic or as a chapter. And it was more militaristic or more naval than the previous one. All domain access, what they explained was that it is appropriate freedom of action in any domain, the sea, air, and land. That is the normal thing that it used to be always. But then they added space, cyberspace, and electromagnetic spectrum also. So in Pivot Asia or US Maritime Strategy 2015, they said Indo Asia Pacific. Previously, they used to call it Indian or the Asia Pacific separate. Now they call it Indo Asia Pacific, joining Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. And their reach was spanning from the east coast of Africa to the west coast of the uh, US. The Indo Pacific region continues to increase in significance. And that is where they were going to concentrate in the entire region. Now, in 2020, they have come up with the next maritime strategy. It is even more robust than the previous one. So the only one which was a little humanitarian was 2007. Now this one is even more, uh, continue to contain sea control, power projection, deterrence, and all domain naval access. Now they say all domain naval, naval power. And then it says dominate the oceans. And this strategy basically is called TS, uh, TSMS, it is cutting out in the front, and uh, title is Advantage at Sea. TSMS is Tri-Services Maritime Strategy. Now, Tri-Services is not the typical uh, Tri-Services that the Army, Navy, and Air Force. This is Tri-Services is Navy, Coast Guard, and the Marines, because they, they, previously they called them Sea Services, now they're they Tri-Services. So in, they, say, they are saying we are on the leading edge of the great power competition each and every day. So this competition that we are talking about is there and it is documented by them now. Sea control, power projection, and the capability to dominate the oceans must be our primary focus. Integrated all domain naval power. And they, they described then the naval power, uh, the all domain from sea flow to space across the world's oceans, littorals, and coastal areas ashore also. And in the cyber domain, information environment, and electromagnetic spectrum, TSMS focuses on China and Russia. They clearly say that it focuses on China and Russia, the two most significant threats, and specifically on China. It says China represents the most pressing long-term strategic threat. We prioritize competition with China due to its growing economic and military strength. 
and increasing aggressiveness. China's behavior and military growth places it on a trajectory that will challenge our ability, and we are at an inflection point. We must maintain resolve to compete with, deter, and if, if necessary, defeat our adversaries. So it is very aggressive in nature, this is strategy. Now, with this, let's see what is the China. China typically used to be a land-oriented country, as we all know, just like our country, but they changed, they evolved over the period of time. So, in fact, before coming to China, sorry, the competition continuum that the Americans uh, in the, their strategy, they say, the, in the US joint doctrine, they had three elements, cooperation, competition, short of war, and armed conflict. But this TSMS says it is day-to-day -day competition, which includes cooperation. Cooperation is just one part of the day-to-day -day competition, crisis and conflict. Now, the, with the China, we are talking about the defense white papers of China. They started issuing these uh, defense white papers since 92. Previously, there was nothing documented. Defense white papers, 99, since 99. So the first defense white paper was in 99, which was China's national defense in 98. And eight defense paper was very important. That is, uh, in April 2013, the diversified employment of China's armed forces. And then in 2015, they came up with the first time seeing China's military strategy. How they uh, they've evolved towards the sea and how their thinking has changed. The, to save, uh, it says that to safeguard China's maritime rights and interests and to safeguard China's overseas interests. So now they have more overseas interests and now they are getting global. PLA Navy is speeding up the transition from defense on the near seas to protection missions on the far seas. So for a long, long time, they remained with, with, uh, confined to the near seas and now they're talking about the far seas. And it is not without a reason. In fact, I may mention here that in 93, a Chinese ship, Yinha, it was coming from China and going to Kuwait. US Navy stopped it. And they said, we have credible information that they are carrying arms and ammunition for Iran and it is just uh, Chinese kept on saying, no, it is not. You can see the uh, cargo bill, et cetera, et cetera. For more than a week, the ship was uh, not allowed to go into any harbor and US Navy contained it. China was not really very strong at that time, so they budged a little. They said, okay, you can have the inspection done, but in a neutral country, in a, not in a neutral, but in a third country. So finally, that GNA ship was inspected in Saudi Arabia, and nothing was found. Despite that, US did not apologize. They said, we had credible in, uh, intelligence, and we did it in good faith, that's it. So Chinese kept this in mind. Chinese always think long term and keep their cool when it is needed. So they started having their interest in the Farsis and it is going, as we will see. China's military strategy, this paper says, the traditional mentality that land or ways see must be abundant. This may have some lesson for us. Great importance be attached to protecting maritime rights and interests. And China's crucial critical security domains are seas and oceans, top of the line, then outer space, cyberspace, and nuclear forces, almost similar to the US. China's policies in the 2017 National Defense Paper, it says prepare to take on greater responsibilities for regional and global security. Rules of individual countries meaning USA, should not automatically become international rules. China will build a strong national defense force that is commensurate with China's international standing. Some people say China is having this string of policy strategy. In fact, not some people. It is this term was basically coined by the Indians, as far as I know, and then picked up by others also. And they quote this starting from Gawada to all these regional ports. China never says this, and China has disowned this, that we do not have such a strategy. These are our economic interests, and these ports are basically for the commercial purposes, not for the military purposes. But nevertheless, they keep saying. Anyhow, 
China has made a great wall at sea as per the Western Oceanographer. Now coming to the third wannabe big war, Indian maritime thinking. Before coming to their present thinking or current thinking, even the historically, this is what they said. A purpose connect, please. Okay. Whoever controls the Indian Ocean has India at mercy. And they said, India cannot exist without the Indian Ocean being free. And what is the definition of being free in the Indian mind is the Indian Ocean must therefore remain truly Indian. And this is the reason, ladies and gentlemen, till the end of the Cold War, India opposed presence of any US, any foreign naval power or any foreign naval ships, etc., in the region. But after the uh, end of the Cold War, they realized a real political place, and now they have started alliances with the US and the other navies, and they welcome them. They issued Indian Maritime Doctrine in 2004. I've given the page number, etc., just for reference. The key to controlling the Indian Ocean lies in controlling the choke points, important islands, and the vital trade routes. On page 63, it says, Indian Ocean trade control of choke points could be useful as a bargaining chip in the international power game, where the currency of military power remains a stark reality. So you can see the hegemonic designs in, documented in their own documents. Then in the conflict scenarios, this we must keep telling our neighbors in the Gulf, Iran and others. Then the Indian maritime doctrine conflict scenario says operations in the extended neighborhood. We are the neighbors. Now they must consider who are the extended neighborhood. And that is a genuine conflict scenario for them. And why? Protecting persons of Indian origin and Indian interests abroad. Where are the maximum number of Indian origin personnel? Of course, in the Gulf. And pr protecting them is a genuine conflict scenario for them in case there is any problem with them. Safeguarding Indian energy assets outside territorial India. This is the real bull in the China shop. And that is what is creating the problems basically in this region. In 2004, in the Indian Maritime Doctrine, areas of interest were only from Hormuz to Malacca, shown in the yellow with those arts. And areas of secondary interest were along the east coast of Africa and Red Sea. Then in 2015, Indian Maritime Strategy, the areas of secondary interest previously shown have become the areas of primary interest. That is the east coast of Africa down to the all areas and Red Sea, all these are their primary interest. And they've extended their secondary interest to even west coast, Mediterranean and Pacific and Southeast Indian Ocean also. And in fact, when I showed this slide in NDU in one of the lectures, so the Africans <laughs> question, they said, how can they claim their interest in the west coast of Africa? Some African students said, I said, ask them, not me. But this is what is documented, you can see that. So Indian Ocean, India's try is to make it India's ocean. This is not my, me saying, this was an Australian writer who wrote that India is basically trying this. Maritime challenges, ladies and gentlemen, as we said initially also are of transnational in nature or global in nature and therefore require a collaboration approach, not this hegemonic design by any one country or the region. Maritime challenges go beyond the narrow concept of interstate conflicts. Collaborative maritime security is actually the taking place and they, I mean, is the a key thing and it must be in, encouraged and must be adopted by us. As far as Pakistan is concerned, no, in fact, no one nation has the resources required. And this was the 2007 U.S. Maritime Strategies statement by the Merlin that no one nation has the resources required to combat all these things that were mentioned earlier from piracy to trafficking and all kinds of things. So in an interconnected world, the burden of security has to be shared. Now, just taking the missile of IORA, which used to be IORARC, that is the Regional Cooperation Forum, Indian Ocean Regional Association, 
Now you can see in green, all these are members, but not Pakistan. And they have blocked our foreign office. Of course, I'm sitting in, uh, I was standing in the Foreign Office uh, Institute. They have been trying a lot. Pakistan Navy has been trying to uh, uh, do whatever it could, but they have all refused because the IRA constitution says that the entry of any new member has to be on consensus. So India every time objects and we are not a member. And that is the reason that the Australian writer had said that India basically wants to be, uh, make Indian Ocean as the India's Ocean. Now, there was another uh, forum which has been created, Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. This is restricted. This is basically naval, not overall. There is a naval chief uh, uh, attend this. To increase maritime cooperation along navies, providing an open and inclusive forum. So Pakistan has joined it. Pakistan Navy has also become an observer at West Pacific, Western Pacific Naval Symposium since April 14. Pakistan Navy post 9-11 situation, obviously when it was a turbulent situation at that time, so they started under the UN Charter, the Coalition Maritime Campaign Plan, CMCP as you, we used to call them. So we negotiated with the Americans and the other partners and we joined in 2004 the Coalition Maritime Campaign Plan and the task force 150 in 2006 we is the first time that we commanded task force 150 and by now we have commanded it more than anybody else including admiral alim and the, the task force uh, 151 as well and when for well, the first time command was given to the pakistan navy at uh, the dr jeffrey till the famous maritime strategist he wrote in his article in December 2006, the fact that Pakistan Navy recently has been interest, interested with the command of Task Force 150 is a strong evidence of its significance for theater security cooperation and coalition building. Then in 2007, uh, based on our experience in the Task Force 150 and interaction with other things, so we started, Pakistan Navy started this Amman series of combined exercises. And 2009, when the piracy was a big issue of Somalia or Horn of Africa, so there was a task force 151 created. So Pakistan Navy joined that also, and we have commanded that also more than anybody else. Among all the participants navies, PN has the highest occupancy time in both the task forces. Maritime security, the Amman exercises basically are in their theme is Amman series they are very important and a commendable effort in promoting peace and security, not aimed at any country or perceived threat from any country. It is our group of countries aimed at common threats to peace and security at sea. It is inclusive, not exclusive. All are welcome. And in fact, the last Amman exercise, China, USA, Russia, all the opponents, they all came in. They all joined and they had this exercise together. And also along with this, they have this International Maritime Conference, which is also very useful. So there's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I had to say. More on this in case you have given the question answer session. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such a factual and informative uh, presentation. I would now move to our next speaker for today, Dr. Zafar Nawaz Jaspal. Uh, Dr. Jaspal is an Islamabad-based analyst and professor at the School of Politics and International Relations, Qaid Azam University. Over to you, sir. Admiral's presentation, who spent his entire life on the sea. So definitely from looking from here, the sea, and then identifying its significance is too difficult and not comparable. But anyway, I tried to 
rehammer or re-emphasize on a few important issues which have already been identified. First thing is that we have to keep in mind that this geopolitic, geopolitics with the domination of geostrategic, it is back. So in this current situation, the way we are looking here, the geoeconomics will be moving ahead. Though geoeconomics, when this term was coined by Lutwak, was also for coercion, for blackmailing, like geo military power. But however, we start looking geoeconomic as a benign term for everyone. Looking this for a win-win with reference to Pakistan's national security document with reference to the connectivity. But in reality, geoeconomics is also win lose kind of an arrangement. So we still find in the geopolitics, geoeconomic is there, but it has now gained a secondary role as compared to the geostrategic trends. This is the reality. And if somebody has any doubt, just see three things together Ukrainian war. Last week of the June, I think on 29th June, NATO released this 2022, you can say document, security document. And then what is happening in our region? So that qualifies that the Indian Ocean region is a pivot of geopolitical transforming world order. As Admiral rightly pointed out, that in the maritime, you have to have a transnational outlook. And uh, in this globalized world, especially which is very much interconnected and which is very much exposed to new emerging technologies, this interconnectivity qualifies, which was earlier referred, it qualifies that this pivot of the world is vulnerable to traditional and non-traditional security challenges. So in that context, when we look about this, the geostrategic and geoeconomic domains, <clears throat> we find it that it is a maritime highway linking transcontinental human and economic relations. It is very much important for trade routes, you have seen in these slides. And at the same time, it is also very much attractive for economic and strategic pursuit, but at the same time exposed to great powers. Let me here draw your attention to the recent development. Biden was in Saudi Arabia or in the other Middle Eastern state. It was, he was not there for a trade. It was very much global, you can say, geopolitics. Trade was just a secondary issue. And he was trying to show, if you see the same picture, that Gulf states or Middle Easterns or Nima is with us. Then we have seen yesterday or day before yesterday, Putin was in the region. And he, with whom he was sitting, Iranian Khamenei and the Turkish president. It's a very <clears throat> interesting phenomenon. If you look about this, though the Western literature try to produce it autocratic and democracy, no, it's nothing. On both sides, you find similar trades. But there is an interesting point. In the second triangle, you find three leaders, which has a more popularity, religious personality popularity. And these are the things giving us a new kind of a outlook of the global strategic environment. And this triangle is now in our neighborhood. And we have been struggling, I think, since the beginning of the 21st century, at least I can say, to balance our relations with all these powers, keeping in mind priorities of our interest. So having said this, when we look about the trends in the global politics, they indicate that the Indian Ocean would witness a new format of strategic competition between and among the great powers. 
in the near future. The strategic competition will facilitate and increase the extra regional actors role in Indian Ocean Affairs and also transform security dynamics of the ocean. But here, it's too difficult to qualify to whom we are saying extra regional. If you can go with the geographical interpretation of the Indian Ocean, yes, literal states are geographical stakeholders. But if we are looking the 21st century global trends, then everyone is there. And it's geographical significance, which India has been trying and thinking that it is an India's ocean or it's a backyard. And the Americans 2017 National Security Strategy document, which was released on 18 December 20, 2018, uh, 2017, it categorically stated India has a role to play in the South Asia, in Indian Ocean and beyond. That encouraged India. But at the same time, when Indian own 2015 strategy, and then it's, you can say again, conquering the America's Indo-Pacific strategy, it means India unconsciously is giving up its ambitious right of India's ocean, it is not Indo-Pacific. This is a very important point, which we, are, we have to take into account. It's just like that when India wants to become a great power, according to their understanding, they acquired the nuclear weapons, which gave us an advantage to nuclearize and its ambition to be a great power in South Asia on the same day when Pakistan tested the cold test. I'm talking about not the hot test, in March 1983, it was done. So by this way, same is in 2015, when Indians themselves start talking about the Indo-Pacific strategy or what the Moody in a high manner said, from look east to act east, that has clearly, you can say, link, open up the Indian Ocean from the other. And when the Pacific comes into it automatically, it brings the China, it brings the other powers, a legitimate actor in the Indo-Pacific. Now here, when I was reading this document of 2022 of the, what you call it, NATO, they categorically said in the document, it's documented, approved by the 30 NATO countries. It said, Euro-Atlantic security is very much linked with the indo Pacific security or with this kind of a region. And in this document, when they were qualifying, where they said that India, uh, Russia is a challenge in the Europe, India is a systematic challenge in the Asia. No, uh, China is a systematic challenge in the Asia. In the entire NATO's history, first time they used this word, China as a threat in their official document. And from there, it qualifies the two developments, AUKUS and what we call it, this Quad. We do agree the Quad was, you can say, conceived as a part of a non-traditional security threat way back in early 21st century. But when it was rebooted in 2017, it was very clear, have a dimension of military security and then, especially last year, when there was a Quad summit, in that summit, the speeches which were made by President Biden and, President, and Prime Minister Modi, they clearly said security, military security dimension impression was given. And in a reaction to that, first time the Chinese analysts started look, saying it's an Asian version of NATO. So that is the way how we try to see that quartz, quartz uh, you can say, evolution. We have to wait and see that whether Korea, South Korea will be part of it or not, because if they go, they have to lose a big side from the China and they are trying to balance it. But on the other side, AUKUS. AUKUS is a very uh, agreement, a revealing agreement, though it seems that it's a, you can say, white, Anglo-Saxon kind of arrangement between the British and the Americans and the Australians. They kept the French out of it. 
which French were very much upset because French were earlier dealing with the Australia for its submarines. But for me, the most important dimension of this is endorsing the significance of the nuclear. Because nuclear propelled submarine is a platform for a war equipment. So how you can say a platform is nuclearized and the delivery vehicle, even if it's a non it's a conventional, it's not a nuclear weapon. The Americans or the Western analysts, unfortunately, from the uh, other parts of the world, there's a lesser saying or interpretation. It's a violation of Article 1, Article 2 of the NPT. It's not, it is not covered by the grandfather clause even of any kind of an agreement between Australia, Britain, or US. Now, what is the alarming factor here for the Indian Ocean littoral state that they are bringing, though India is not part, but now Australia, and they, they are bringing in this. And if you look about the, in a broader picture, the Indo-US strategic partnership with reference to the Quad, Lima, Comcasa, and Bika kind of the agreements, and then try to see that the way India is in, in, including it, though the Americans say it's a partner. But after Lima and Bika, it qualifies to be an alliance. This is a very interesting discourse, which we have to keep in mind, though partner and alliances have a differences, but these acts gives us a alliance. And uh, in that context, when we look about this AUKUS, and then the way of these things moving out, how we can ignore it as a Pakistan. We are a major stakeholders. We, it's another thing that Pakistan, apart from building the Pakistan Navy in the last four or five decades, we have no, uh, now we have started reading this document, Blue Economy. We, we merely focus on the geostrategic domain as an insecure, military insecure state that I understand the limitations, but uh, we today don't have our own naval, you can say sea lines having a trade, uh, you can say all these containers X, Y, Z. That is one of the reasons your exports are, especially, especially your agri exports are with a big question mark. But still, we cannot ignore this. Why we cannot ignore this? Because the entire way of looking this world is, as Admiral used the word string of pearls, it was first time used the term in the energy document by the American scholar. And they started saying it's a military, though Chinese never own it or need, uh, but we cannot ignore it. Your platforms have a multi dimensions. So we, we say Gwadar is not a part of their military calculations or we are not permitting them, but in a broader geopolitics, yes, it is a part. And in a way they try to build what they call it, a necklace of diamonds. For me, string of pearl is not a problem, but necklace of diamond in either shape, whether it's a theoretical, if it is a threat to, to uh, today, uh, tomorrow, or day after tomorrow, maybe it will be practical. For me, that is a problem. Because that is also meant for encircling me, not encircling China. So this is the second dimension where Pakistan has to be very careful. And naturally, we are working to overcome it. As I mentioned already, in this case, the Americans and the, their uh, goodwill coming up and the way they are building. Now, here is a point for our responses, or at least I do agree in the international politics, frankly, there is no free lunch. We can make a rhetoric, we sensitize, because this is a part of the game, diplomatically, academically, but the real things are guided by interests. And we have to be very, you can say, careful while identifying our interests and then linking it with the rest of the world. Now here, we have been trying to balancing, but on a strategic chessboard, unfortunately, balancing sometimes become very, you can say, difficult. 
And the problem in this current affair, you can see situation is that even a neutral state, 200 years neutrality maintaining state, what we call it Sweden, we can find it Finland. They are become, they are no more neutral. What the Trump, you can say, no, no, this Biden in his speech at the Madras summit in a jubilant manner, what he said, he said, Putin was trying to Finland, Finlandization of Europe. Now he has a NATOization of Europe. Now NATOization of Europe and NATOization of Asia, where we are. For me, maybe it's not a problem. Whatever they are doing at the Euro Atlantic, whatever they are doing in the Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific. But for me, it's very challenging and important when they look make India as a most important partner because the increasing naval power of India is a more challenging for me. If for uh, whatever the transformation takes place there, whether I like it or not, security dilemma or action like a puzzle action action cycle compels me to invest and my economy is not bearing it. And I cannot improve my economy without improving my security of sea lines and how I can economically manage them. So if we are talking about a maritime security issues, you have to take into account geo strategic agreed. We are managing it, whatever capacity we have it. Geoeconomic, unfortunately, we are not managing. And within this geoeconomics, if you go on a non-traditional, partially which domain terrorism X, Y, Z, and Mirror very rightly pointed out that we were part of this 2006 or these or our Amman X side. We are managing it. We are doing it. But how to benefit from the sea economically still need a more to do. With this, I submit finally that Indian Ocean region is having an immense political and economic opportunities for Pakistan. The caching of these external opportunities requires stability in the region and intelligent engagement with the literal state in the Indian Ocean. Washington, Beijing, and New Delhi would remain the key actors, including now Moscow. Key actors, these four in the Indian Ocean strategic, on the Indian Ocean strategic chessboard. Realistically, destabilization in the Indian Ocean region cannot be ruled out in the near future. And here, as a footnote, normally we used to say, it was interesting, I was asked by one of the editors to write on nuclearization of the Indian Ocean with reference to a chapter in the book a few years back on the India-Pakistan. And when I was working on it, I came to across that it was already nuclearized because wherever the American fleet goes, wherever the uh, French goes, and French is a major Indian Ocean country, wherever the British goes, wherever the Chinese are expected, wherever the Russians are expected with reference to the Syria and they're working on the harbors there, they are already nuclear powered and Israel is already there. And now, agreed, maybe that those all nuclear rise powers in the Indian Ocean are ignorable for the time being. But when the Indian Navy's spokesperson, Captain Sharma, in the presence of the Indian Naval Chief in April 2019, said that India has deployed nuclear assets at the sea. After, during the Pulwama military standoff, that is a, for us, what we call it, nuclearization of the Indian Ocean for, for us, which is not ignorable. That's the way we have to look at it with this. My final submission is, yes, we have to intelligently manage Indian Ocean geopolitics, keeping in mind our challenges, geostrategic challenges, which are permanent, perpetual, and exploring our geoeconomic opportunities so that we cannot be blackmailed at that where in that domain with this thank you very much
Thank you, Dr. Jaspal, for such an enlightening talk. Um, as we move towards the end of the session, I would now like to invite Vice Admiral Retired Abdul Ladeem, Director General, National Institute of Maritime Affairs, for his concluding remarks. Q&A, oh yeah, we can do that. Um, I now officially open the floor for the question and answers. Thank you. Assalamualaikum, sir. Raza Khan from PTU. Uh, sir, uh, uh, your uh, presentation as always was excellent, but what pains me always is that we are reacting to what India is doing. Uh, we are never proactive. Uh, uh, me and uh, uh, Dr. Jaspal were in Egypt uh, three years ago. Uh, there was a conference in Cairo and I was covering that exclusively. Uh, the thing is, our vision sort of, we are just reacting to, okay, India is not allowing us to enter IORA. India is having uh, you know, agreements with Seychelles, Madagascar, uh, uh, and uh, Mauritius. You just, I just noticed Scotra, and you have placed the UAE over there. It pained me two years ago as well, that when the state, which actually doesn't exist anymore, Yemen, nation, as a nation state, why didn't we uh, got an opportunity and perhaps put our uh, uh, navy or our army or anything you know of that sort? Because practically, it, 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 now UAE has filled in the gap. We have never taken a proactive measure to counter India's influence in the Indian Ocean region. The same goes with other states. We are just reacting and pleading. And this docile policy of ours, I was covering a, a talk by General uh, Khalid Kidwai of SPD. And he clearly mentioned it was an exclusive talk at your neighborhood, uh, ISSI. And he said that India had launched a submarine carrying nuclear weapons after Pulwama. And it was near Gwadar, which was detected by our, our uh, Navy. The point is, if India is not uh, playing by any bloody rules, the so-called rules-based order, why, are we, why should we play with the rules? Our nation state's existence is at stake. So isn't it time that our Navy talks to perhaps SPD or our GHQ or the, you know, the uh, other bodies to perhaps devise a plan to counter India? Thank you. And uh, I really hope that you uh, project the naval aspects to the authorities concerned as much as the Navy wants to do it. Navy has been proactive, and uh, but within the limits. We all know in our country's situation how limited is Navy's influence or Navy's good. Just let me give you one example, my personal example, in which I was involved, my, by personal, I mean, in which I was directly involved. That after 9-11, when the situation was so, and I mentioned about the CMCP and we joined it in uh, 2004, we realized India had not joined. We realized that this is going to be a long-term thing and it will impact us. So we talked to the Americans, we convinced them it was not an easy thing to do it. Why I'm saying I can go into those details. I was personally involved in this to convince them that Pakistan Navy will be most useful in this area uh, for the maritime security overall. The uh, foreign office people sitting here. After 9-11, every day there used to be a deconfliction meeting at the GS headquarters, attended by the US ODRP people, our foreign office and our services and all everybody. Because in the same area, our Atlantics were flying with missiles loaded, Americans were flying, their ships, our ships, their submarine, our submarine. So every morning there was a fear that somehow there may not be a conflict situation. So there used to be a de-conflict meeting every morning. After 9-11, after 9-11, I'm talking about. So it was every day and there used to be article and all. Then we started discussing with the Americans. In fact, this is what I'll even refer to. The ODRP at that time happened to be an Air Force guy, which is very rare. Normally it is Army, Marine or Navy. So uh, I was listening to operations. So I uh, called him over and talked to him and discussed him. I explained to the, uh, I mean, you have to convince the other country that it is in their own best interest to uh, join or cooperate with us. You can't do it. 
anyhow after a long discussion it was convinced they were convinced and then we became member of the cmcp and this task force india reacted since then and we had put these conditions various conditions some written some unwritten that uh, we will not do anything against iran or any other regional country and it will just be a general maritime security you will not allow the indian navy to be part of this task force 150 which has been maintained till now somewhat it has modified now and they have some representation in the bahrain but previously no so all these things kept on going there and they seem uh, but they, they were convinced and we joined within our own country as you said the policy reference to join the cmcp which was all in our favor with this we had this then amman exercises equipment and all these things it took me eight months to convince our own people including foreign office we put up a case presentation and then there's a summary via ministry of defense to foreign office and uh, to the prime minister jamali used to be the uh, prime minister and they were isi jas headquarter they were most of them opposed it so jamali said that there has to be a consensus only then i'll give some decision he sent the file back and he said let there be a meeting between the foreign secretary and the defense secretary it took me three months for the two secretaries to sit together and convince them that sir, no harm. If the Indian Navy has joined, and they are going to check our ships here, then they will be happy. And eventually, we will join. So, the Navy has its limitation, but it does proactively do whatever it, it can. In the Middle East, that we were talking about. Sorry, I am taking a little long, but uh, let me explain so that it, most of these aspects are not known to the people. So that, you know, most of the Gulf countries were trained by Pakistan Navy. When I was in Naval Academy in 1970, we had more Arab cadets, basically Saudi cadets, than Pakistani cadets. Even now, most of the admirals of the Saudi Navy are Pakistan trained, including their naval chief. So we had a lot of influence on uh, those countries, which is now obviously uh, depleting. Uh, but nevertheless, this, all these things were, uh, and similarly, this IORA, et cetera, you mentioned, absolutely right. We should not be restricted to that. We must join this agreement. We can create our own, or as, as, at least for the Northwestern uh, Indian Ocean. And we can invite China, that, uh, China will, will work and the uh, rest of the countries. So all these countries, those who are members of the IORA, can be members of this one also. If, even if India wants to join, we should welcome them. And if they don't want to join, let there be their own. So Navy has its limitation. Navy keeps on putting up the, its point of view at various forums. Uh, you mentioned uh, General Kidwai is an excellent person and very, very open-minded. Uh, I, again, I dealt with him uh, from, from the Navy aspect when he, you, he was actually DGSPD. And he was very cooperative. And whatever is possible, uh, we are doing. Thank you. Let me rather answer in a more different manner. First of all, Pakistan is reacting, you should use the word. No, we are not reacting. We must be very careful. Our, we have a problem in our analysis or in our discourse is that instead of properly analyzing the things, identifying the things, we use some words which are or jargons which are very sensational and provoking we have to see the limitation india is a big power india is a seven times big power and it has a more opportunities rather than from the 1947 we are living in some kind of challenges we were bandwagoning a bandwagoning state can be always reactive or following or looking the others because you have to bandwagon. And in this bandwagoning, Americans didn't own you. They always maintain a relation with our transactional and we know it. That's the reason we never trust on them after 1971 and we had our own nuclear weapons. But once we have received or able indigenously to balance India, or at least to deter India, we ended up in a war zone, four decades war zone, 
and when you are in a war zone again you are you have a lesser choice so war zone country cannot prosper cannot decide it reacts and then when we are coming out of this war zone we are in a domestic turmoil who will deal with pakistan when there is nobody knows that who will be there in the next 3 to 5 years so this is the first thing and this is a reality second important thing is that when we look about this multipolarity and sort of a thing we have a choice but interestingly we we spoke we we are not against cpac is very important but we have to keep in mind that are we only a root or we are a country which has to prosper so in the economic zones if they have to come to invest how we have to keep in mind socio economic indicators of that zone which is not in the domain of the chinese thinking or when we were negotiating it was not in the domain of our thinking we wanted a quick fixes to show in the next election so that that is a problem so we are we are maturing similarly you're coming towards the indian ocean as i pointed out we did in one domain well in a geostrategic domain when i was in the amman excise frankly 45 countries were there that is a reflection trust on your need 45 countries leading world countries participating that makes a set even we whatever we can say limitations we are developing we are at a check for a choke point we can manage and spoil things if we misbehave but on in the geoeconomics still that is a political domain political vision people think that a maritime in ministry going to a krachai person it's enough no you need a vision coming from this kind or the other kind of think tanks when i was invited by reema for this presentation frankly i had a other things to do more because of our closing semester only when she pointed out that there is a cooperation between the maritime institute and the our institute and we are looking forward and coming up with some kind of a concrete paper how we can make pakistan relevant in this geopolitics of indian ocean i'm not talking about geostrategic or geographic geopolitics of the indian ocean that was attractive for me i said let's go learn from rawsa learn from the other and it's five after we had a institute of strategic study we had a institute of regional study we had a many other institute why there is missing this document that means that i cannot criticize it's not a crit that means to realize we are evolving now we are now thinking about it or we are becoming more pakistani civil military bureaucrat i'm sorry to say this the one leading bureaucrat is with me and in front sitting bureaucracies are always status quo oriented they are implementers if you think or i think that they will be giving us a new idea they can give us a inputs but they are implementer executors the looking ahead where you can overcross the barrier of reaction and become proactive that comes from the think tanks from the academia and unfortunately they are ignored areas in this thing sorry we'll continue with this argument just to explain the overall this as a uh, professor uh, just Paul just mentioned that this seminar or cooperation between the IRS and uh, NIMA developed quite a bit in this maritime aware we all say basically from the naval uh, background that there is sea blindness in our country and again I'll just go, uh, quote my personal example in 2004 or 2005 i was giving a lecture at staff and command and staff college quetta to army officers and i talked about all this and obviously there were question and answer sessions then few years back i was talking to the war course in the ndu and in the one of the question and answer session the guy sitting in the front row a lieutenant colonel he stood up and that lieutenant colonel is now already a general so he stood up he said sir in 2004 when i was a major you said all these things 
And now in the, this 2016 or 17, you're again saying all these things. So what is the headway? Or are you just talking in air, all these things? So that is the mindset. In my mindset, he was in a positive sense that is the development. Yes, there is development since then. In 2004, 5 that I was talking about, there was no lecture on maritime economy in the NDU. Now there are regular. Now there is lecture on this in Command of College Coast also. There was no NEMA. There was no cooperation of this type. There's many things being talked about the below economy. There are many forums on below economy, etc. So things are changing. But the most important thing remains that we have to change the thinking or convince, actually not the change, they need to convince the political leadership or all parties that this is an important aspect. Only then the things will develop. And these recommendations hopefully will go to them and they will be. Thank you. The next question. Assalamu alaikum, sir. I'm Faisal and uh, always a treat to listen to both of you. Two quick questions, for one each for both of you. Uh, from Admiral Rao, sir, would you please like to enlighten us on what were the circumstances that we could not become founding member of IORA uh, despite, uh, despite uh, our location uh, very suitable for joining it? And uh, to Dr. Jaspal, uh, you say that uh, perhaps India has given up its claim of making Indian Ocean India's ocean. Don't you think it's still pursuing the same objective yet with a different strategy? They somehow came to know that they could not do it alone because I know Iranians don't buy their argument and uh, they say that Indian Ocean is for everybody. So perhaps by joining this, act, playing active role in Indo-Pacific strategy and joining Quad and I2U2, they are actually uh, pursuing their same objective of making this area as India's ocean. And given the fact that they are not in AUKUS, it also signifies that their primary focus is in Indian Ocean, not in Pacific Ocean. Thank you. Okay, first the IRA. IRA basically was initiated by the Indians and they kept this clause in the, in the constitution of IRA that it will be consensus, that everybody has to agree to any, anything. Else. But of course, it is not in the Indian uh, interest, and that's why and that's why they still keep blocking, despite from uh, support from the Australians and the, all the regional countries, etc. So basically, Indian, Indian. And now, uh, talking about Iran, Edward Faisal has been uh, our uh, defense patchy in uh, Iran, so he knows about that a lot. Iran, as you recall, in this INS uh, seminar, uh, uh, which is uh, conducted, is, uh, the naval chief. So the naval, I was already retired, but naval chief was kind to take me along, and I presented a paper. Especially then uh, was there at that time. When we explained to them that the CPEC, in fact, my theme uh, was that CPEC is not a military uh, kind of thing; it is an economic thing. And when we presented all the our facts, etc., most of those sitting over there, including the foreign attaches, they were all that uh, they had different uh, connotations and different information to them. And special, in fact, after my presentation and all, many of the attaches they approached him and they said, okay, we would like to talk to him over And this is the first time that we are uh, listening to this perspective that this is total economic uh, exercise. In fact, in the CPAC thing, I explained to them in that exercise that. Gawadar port, yes, we, it was revealed by the Chinese help, but Gawadar port's agreement was basically given to the port Singapore authority, not to the Chinese. Had they performed or had they uh, wanted to continue, they could have continued. So there was no question of uh, China's uh, any setup in Gawadar. So it was because of the circumstances and economic reasons primarily that it has gone to China. And all those, those the points were there. Iranians, yes. They are our neighbors, they are our friends and all. But in the same uh, event, I'll just mention it to you. When there was, after the, uh, this event, when they were used, uh, there was a dinner for the naval chiefs. Uh, of course, I had not, uh, I had come back at the earlier, so it was only for the naval chiefs. So the seating arrangements that the Iranians made, because the Iranians were the host, 
So India was given position next to the Iranian on top of the table and Pakistan lower down. I'm just saying these small little things, but these do matter. Our uh, staff, they uh, checked up and this is what it was. They informed the CNS, I was sitting with CNS. And we told them that if you do this, first we asked them, why have you done this? They said, because this is Indian Ocean Naval Symposium was initially initiated by the India. So they are the primary uh, person. And then we objected very strongly. In fact, CNS told his staff to object. Uh, in case you do this, then our CNS is not going to attend to dinner. You can have whatever you want to do. And to avoid that, then they amended it. It has to be alphabetical as per the international. Then it was done. So they have some sympathies that side also, then some sympathies with, with us also. And uh, but we have to see our interest first. Uh, sorry. Add on this uh, Iran, we have to keep in mind here because the problem in our world is that we are very much divided nation. Some move with the Sunni inclination to the Saudi Arabia, who awarded the butcher of Gujarati's best award, and the sums move towards Iran without thinking. Iran had a defense pact with India since 2003, revived in 2009, and still it is there. It's another thing that the Trump trumpeted the Indian the manner, and the Indians started getting the oil from the Saudi Arabia. Iranians were ditch. Northern corridor was from Mumbai to Chabahar and Kandahar and upward, and it was announced as a new silk route by Henry Clinton in 2010. So we have to take all these things into account when we are looking that unlike Pakistan, that we put all eggs in one basket, intellectually and analytically. I'm not talking about the officials, even intellectually and analytical, analytically. That's why we have a problem. We have to come out of that We as an independent nation. But now your point was, yes, India, and it's an established fact. India says Indian Ocean is their lay. It's in their back. But what's about the other littoral states? If India is nearer to the Malacca with the Ainaba Nicobar Island command, we are nearer to the Strait of Hamus. So it's not anyone's. But still, as in India, there's a fashion to speak big. And they have some advantages in that case. And unfortunately, sometimes they are intellectually, their representatives are very powerful in this. I can just give you an example. I'm not praising it, but it's a reality. What their foreign minister said while in the ocean, uh, by referring to the Europeans, the Europeans think themselves and they, they, they think the European problem is the entire world problem. And our problem is our problem. Have you expect from any Pakistani this thing? So India give kind of these statements theoretically, they present themselves like they start using India's ocean. And people start using in the writing because they are saying, but it start gaining a currency. But when their official document said Indo-Pacific, it means that hyphening it. They themselves, and nobody is debating it, but that's I just, it's a, it's a debatable issue. I'm not depending. But now when you say Indo-Pacific, it means it's not your, or if something is not under my control, it's not mine. So they are themselves in their intellectual or in this kind of a thing, they're moving. And here in the international politics, as student international politics, we are always saying that there are certain systemic forces. There are inbuilt strategic dynamics. When you are looking on the like, my elite, political, you can say military, diplomatic, all hearts and minds are towards the West. But the systemic forces are drifting my state towards the That is the reality. So same is that they are thinking that India's is our ocean or India's ocean, but they are, the systemic forces are compelling them that they had to sign the Lima. They had to sign the Bika. They, they, had, they were forced to show military posture which we call it China's military posture, and they were beaten in that in Gulwan. 
And now again, they are trying to balance it. Within India, there is a debate why India is losing its strategic autonomy, which they regain to some extent by getting just 400. And now China, Americans are checkmate. That's why Americans are meeting us every day now. They are open up. Their ambassador is here. Because the Indians are not behaving with them like this. So, but in this process, in these processes, what they are claiming themselves, India's ocean, my understanding is when they go with this look east or announcing Indo-Pacific strategy or their sagar or these kind of the things, they are practically giving up for a greater object. That is my point. So I have a couple of questions, but due to shortage of time, I'll not ask. I perfectly agree with what you said, uh, because the American strategy paper, national security document for 2020, clearly assigned certain tasks to India yes. under the Indo-Pacific strategy. And they want India to act as a policeman in the Indo-Pacific and certain other tasks. Uh, sir, I'm not asking any question, just making a comment. Looking at the topic, I have never come across an expression global states. There are no global states. So basically, the topic should be perspective of lateral states or so major powers or so accordingly. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, due to shortage of time, we would have to wrap the session. The concluding, for concluding remarks, I would like to invite Vice Admiral Retired Abdul Lane, Director General, National Institute for Maritime Affairs. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala khatma nabiyin. His Excellency Ambassador Nadeem Riaz, Vice Admiral Iftikhar Rao, sir, Dr. Zafar Nawaz Jaspal, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and good morning or good afternoon. Just started, good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm so glad that uh, what Neema and IRS conceived a few months ago, today is it's a reality. While IRS domain is vast uh, and it analyzes the strategic situation from various aspects, NEMA focuses always on the maritime affairs. And I'm thankful to Ambassador Nadeem Riaz for his vision uh, of this jointness between the two think tanks, whereby we can come up with some workable strategy which can guide the policymakers to steer our maritime affairs in the right direction. A lot has been done as far as Pakistan maritime interests are concerned, but still there is a big vacuum. And the vacuum is both on account of our failure to balance our relations with the global and regional parts of the Indian Ocean, as well as of due to the fact of sea blindness. And sea blindness, as also alluded to by Admiral Rao, is a phenomena where a person who is otherwise very normal or a community which is otherwise very normal is unable to see the benefits or the interest that are offered by sea or the oceans. And Pakistan as a whole has been suffering this phenomena since we got our independence. Till the war of 1971, Navy has been fighting, not with the Indian Navy, but fighting for its survival. Navy had to struggle even to survive as a defense force. Number of proposals at the highest level were discussed to get away with the Navy and give either a fighter squadron to Air Force to meet our uh, security interest of the Indian Ocean, or at the best to give a submarine squadron to the Navy. And that was it. 
they could the, the policy maker could not understand uh, uh, the dynamics of the maritime uh, security to that extent our uh, second naval chief had promised that we should have a big harbor at gwadar it was in early 50s but the nation was suffering from uh, blindness so much that this offer was outrightly rejected so it was only you know after a lot of efforts the navy had the opportunity to make a base there because it suited navy most but then we sacrificed our you know uh, uh, naval plans because we thought that if we make a naval base and we uh, base and we invest so much at gwadar it will not be feasible then when we make the similar investment for a commercial harbor there so we always professed for a commercial harbor and <clears throat> on our part we developed a base between karachi and gwadar that we call ormara so navy has a base at ormara and we profess that we should have and then uh, in early 2000 some of this realization came but i was referring to 71 and it was only after you know the, the debacle of 71 when the nation as a whole uh, analyzed its failure political failure and the failure on uh, military side we realized that we need to have a, not only a strong navy but navy with all its potential and that is how the navy got its naval air arm the navy got its uh, special services group and submarine force was already there but it got further boost and i'm thankful that since then uh, the existence of navy was recognized but still navy could not get its budget the required budget initially uh, navy uh, as you know when pakistan came to came into being the navy was considered as the senior most service following the royal uh, navy patron but later on it was relegated to two but as far as the budget is concerned most of the time its budget has been relegated to number 3 and uh, <clears throat> the practice continues uh, however uh, notwithstanding uh, uh, the allocation of budget and the limited uh, strength of the navy i believe uh, a lot could have been done as far as the naval doctrine is concerned and the first naval doctrine that we managed to issue was i think uh, Three years back, we started working on it. Uh, Admiral Rao has been working on it for quite long, but the documents are uh, the day of li the light of the day. I think it was only two and a half year or three years back. Now that we have the naval doctrine, uh, and I'm sure uh, naval headquarters is uh, revising, and we will have in a year or two the next version of it. We should be able to understand what are our maritime interests. after the uh, 911 when uh, indian ocean came into focus uh, and we thought that uh, like the war on terror was going on there could be some instability at sea so the world navies decided that we should maintain a presence whereby we do not let that vacuum to exist whereby the uh, non state actors could make use of uh, the less controlled water at sea because the maritime as you know uh, are the common heritage and no one country can do it alone and no one country can be held responsible if there is some vacuum so <clears throat> coalition decided it was question for pakistan whether to join the coalition or not and i'm glad that uh, the policy makers took the right decision we became initially in 2000 or late 2003 the part of uh, first coalition force and later on after about 5 years in 2009 we became the uh, also the partner of the second coalition task force uh, 151 which and both task forces as, as admiral highlighted have been commanded by pakistan navy more than anybody else in fact when our ships used to go for that uh, uh, deployment uh, 80% of the time of deployment was spent over 80% of the time was spent at sea whereas <clears throat> it was only comparable with the us navies rest of the navies would spend let's say 10 days at sea and 20 days in harbor or 12 days at sea and rest of the time of the month in harbor pakistan navy provided that kind of support and got its uh, recognition by all the regional and uh, the other navies
and our condition was that we will remain part of the coalition on one condition that we will not let india to come in and when we participated it was in our own interest because we will not let other navies to come and control the waters which are in our backyard so uh, the waters immediately south of makran coast still coast of africa were under the uh, you know direct uh, uh, <clears throat> surveillance by the units of pakistan navy and about uh, three years back navy further expanded its role and started regional maritime security patrols as we call it rmsps whereby we have identified three axes where apart from the uh, our participation in coalition we are ensuring that those axes uh, navy has a uh, direct monitoring and uh, our maritime interests are ensured however uh, when it comes to our uh, strategic alliance uh, the strategic balancing taking sides or remaining neutral is something that does not fall into the domain of the navy itself i believe uh, maritime think tank as well as the other think tanks can work a lot to decide what are the best options for pakistan and how best we can play our cards for example <clears throat> when we started uh, work on cpac it was not even uh, materialized and we started calling it a big game changer and started all the negative attractions to it till to date in spite of all what we have said we have not been able to uh, dispel the impression that cpac has some linkage with uh, with the chinese military deployment i mean why can't we let the people go and see by themselves gwada <clears throat> i was in a uh, you know talking to a few uh, european ambassadors and none of them was convinced that gwadar has no linkage to uh, chinese military uh, role and i said why don't you ask the foreign office and uh, plan a visit and see it yourself i mean seeing is believing there is no military dimension the only military dimension is the only military navy that can be there is pakistan navy like other bases but uh, they seemed not to you know by my argument so <clears throat> one we should dispel all impressions that uh, cpac has any linkage otherwise what we see in pakistan all uh, negative propaganda and this is not only uh, from the uh, you know people outside pakistan even from within few years back till few years back we thought that like our national uh, ideology like our uh, defense policy cpac is also something which is not controversial and pakistan as a whole has a unified stance on cpac but now you hear voices which are divergent and the views which are not always unanimous so there is a need to deliberate there is a need to dispel the uh, uh, misperceptions and to create a narrative of your own why can't we do that i don't know but <clears throat> i believe that uh, uh, the synergy that we have with uh, with our working with irs uh, which will solely be on the issue of uh, indian ocean our maritime interest in the indian ocean will comprise of six webinars and come uh, seminars and this was the first of that series we will try to uh, you know uh, canvas the maritime interest with different uh, topics uh, and i'm sure after as ambassador uh, nadeem riaz said that we should be able to come up with a uh, in next 6 month we should be able to come up with a clear document having clear deliberations defining what are uh, pakistan's uh, strategic maritime interest and how best we can defend those interest what policies uh, <clears throat> uh, i mean policy changes are required if any coming to the uh, uh, regional and global perspective i believe uh, Uh, us is fast losing its space not only in the indian notion but on the global aspect um, its policies has been more or less reactive uh, to china's initiative like the uh, <clears throat> chinese initiative of bri has been uh, responded to by the west in the term of uh, g7 b3w which is an initiative of the g7 a trillion dollars uh, 
infrastructure project. Uh, in short term, it's called the Build Back Better World. And <clears throat> by the year 2035, something like $40 trillion. And this is, it, the document clearly says uh, in reaction or to respond to the Chinese uh, BRI initiative. And the first uh, <clears throat> part of the G G7B3W was what we saw uh, last month, end of last month, PGII, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, comprising of something like 600 billion, uh, which is to unfold by year 2027. So these initiative clearly dictates that the US does not have its own uh, you know, uh, uh, game, but is now playing in reaction to the Chinese, which have been very wisely uh, playing their cards. And that is what we should learn. Because if you want to build up uh, your interest, first you need to have an economic strength. That economic strength should translate into a military strength and only then you can gain that kind of diplomatic uh, strength that is needed. Without economic and military strength, you cannot dictate or cannot uh, profess your policies. It, as far as we are concerned, uh, the NEMA, I believe uh, to further uh, in, highlight the maritime interest and to give more focus apart from our uh, partnership with the IRS, at NEMA level, we established uh, one of our section uh, to focus, which is headed by Commodore Babur Bilal, which was formal, our former uh, director at NEMA, Indian Ocean Studies Center now. The Indian Ocean Studies Center has a dedicated mandate to uh, identify Pakistan maritime interest and to work on the policies required in that regard. And further to that, uh, uh, last, uh, about uh, two weeks back, there was a conference at uh, uh, Punjab University where um, uh, Commodore Babur was sitting here, the director uh, of the Indian Ocean Street Center, presented an excellent paper titling uh, Indian Ocean Maritime Network. I believe uh, <clears throat> that has a strong potential to be translated into a reality. The, uh, the concept is that uh, uh, not at the state level, but at the different institutes level, at the different think, ta think, ta uh, think tank level, we, uh, we have a coalition of like-minded uh, organizations in the Indian Ocean and we develop, we identify what are the common challenges. Because if you look at the world, probably the Indian Ocean is the least uh, well-integrated nation, uh, region. Um, no other region in the world, uh, even in the African waters, you would see that uh, that kind of vacuum exists. And that is because of the stubbornness of the big country, uh, as Admiral highlighted that uh, in Iora, this, there are few countries missing, but the salient is uh, Pakistan. I remember I was attending uh, one of the IONS uh, summit in Bangladesh, I believe in 2016. And one of the uh, question asked was that, uh, why IORA has not been able to come up with something you know, not noticeable. And uh, one of the former uh, Indian Naval Chief, uh, Arun Prakash replied simply because Pakistan has been missing from that alliance. And if one of the significant partner is missing, how can you produce uh, a significant effect? I'm glad that at least Pakistan, <clears throat> I, I haven't gone, but uh, what Admiral Faisal asked, uh, why Pakistan is missing from uh, Ayora and Admiral very rightly re uh, replied that part joining in requires as unanimous, but this condition applied after the organization has been transformed. Initially, when the invitations were extended, when this organization was formed, somehow Pakistan could not grasp or could not appreciate that we should not miss the uh, opportunity. Same thing happened in IONS. When in January 2008, we got the invitation by the Indian Navy. Uh, I remember uh, uh, we, we were on a visit to uh, Malaysia or uh, Singapore and the uh, vice chief of naval staff asked for a call on to our naval chief. And he personally brought a letter signed by the uh, Indian Naval Chief addressing to our Naval Chief and requesting for Pakistan's participation in the OINS because they also knew from their experience of IORA that without participation of Pakistan, the organization will not turn into a, a useful one. But still it took Pakistan from 2008 till 2000, 
11, I believe, to decide whether we will join it or not. Uh, this time, however, uh, there was no uh, hurdle because all the countries which form part of the Indian Ocean inherently have the right to be part of the ions, even if there is a uh, disagreement in the members that they already had. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that I believe uh, is uh, <clears throat> Professor Jaspal highlighted Indian uh, necklace of diamond, cons uh, the <clears throat> whereby India having entered into uh, uh, agreements and uh, established its influence uh, like India have a uh, number of uh, listening posts, maritime listening posts, and their uh, limited naval bases in the region, which includes uh, Seychelles, Mauritius, Admiral Rao highlighted, Madagascar, Scutra, Maldives, and their agreement with uh, Oman, UAE, uh, US, and even Malaysia, logistic agreement for the Navy. And the concept of Saga, uh, <coughs> the uh, growth and initiative for all concept. We need to not only to counter this, but also to have our own uh, influence. We also need to have uh, uh, our bases outside Pakistan. Till to date, we do not have a single base or uh, an agreement that at least to my knowledge that we have with any of the regional countries. Uh, so we need to, while we, we have you know, a lot of influence in the Middle East and in the regional countries, our foreign office has done a wonderful job, but to translate that goodwill into some uh, physical interaction whereby Pakistan Navy can enjoy that support, uh, which is available uh, in, in case of needs is important. So that is one, uh, the concept of IOM and Indian Ocean Marine Network, I have already explained. Uh, and I believe, uh, the CPAC uh, uh, at the moment uh, is uh, not only that it's not producing the desired results when it comes, CPAC has been very effective when it comes to infrastructure development and you know meeting our uh, requirement of road and uh, power <coughs> production, etc. But the real uh, advantage of CPAC would be once you link the Gawada through the, this corridor and the Gawadar port is then linked with the other uh, maritime regions and acts as a trans shipment as well as transit port. Uh, so far, uh, it's not functioning either as a single port uh, or as a transit port or as a trans shipment port because a lot more is required before Gawadar can do all the three function. Without this, uh, uh, we will continue to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, reservations by the West, by the US, and they will try to, you know, uh, 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 counter uh, CPAC and uh, against to our national interest without us being making any good use of the CPAC and the opportunities that are associated with this. Um, with this, I uh, again thanks uh, uh, IRS. Uh, I thank the honorable speakers uh, for enlightening us for uh, on this very important topic of Indian Ocean's uh, maritime interest. And I also appreciate all of you who have taken out time to attend this uh, activity. I thank you all.